All right. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session on uh, how to create more efficient packaging uh, using the AppV 4.5 SP1 sequencer. My name is Monish Chaturvedi. I'm a premier field engineer based out of a Melbourne office in Microsoft. And uh, part of my job involves uh, working with premier customers, uh, conducting um, health checks and risk assessment programs for AppV, Active Directory, uh, and also conduct uh, technical workshops for customers. So uh, just by show of hands, I'd like to know how many of us are uh, have actually been using AppFi in either production or a test environment. Ah, good. Uh, because the session is uh, based around sequencing, how many of us are uh, or have had experience sequencing applications before? All right, awesome. That's good. All right. Uh, so, as I would like to start with the session, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what this session is all about. Uh, about May last year, a bunch of PFEs like myself, uh, uh, there was another PFE called Justin Zab who presented at TechEd on AppV last year. Uh, we all kind of got together at the Cambridge campus of Microsoft where the AppV dev team is based out of. Um, and our goal during that week was to write a workshop to teach our customers how to do advanced sequencing and troubleshooting. Now, one of the interesting things that happened during that time was that we got invited to a bunch of sessions where uh, the team was actually planning uh, for features to be included in this release of AppV Sequencer. So it was a very rewarding experience in a sense that uh, we got a say in a lot of features that were being debated about whether they should be included or not. Uh, we were also asked for a lot of feedback uh, and when I say my feedback, I mean feedback from customers who I work with and partners who I work with. So we had a good chance to report back those feedback to the actual team and program management uh, so they could decide on what features they should put more importance on. So on a good note, uh, a lot of that feedback made its way into the final product. Um, and I'm quite excited to share some of those new features with you today. Uh, on a flip side, a lot of work that we did with the workshop uh, it's kind of redundant now, and we'll have to go back and do that work again. So uh, my goal for today is to try and introduce as many new features of the new AppV 4.6 SP1 sequencer uh, during the next 75 minutes that I have. Um, I also want to talk about how you can save time during sequencing using the new features of the new sequencer. Uh, and all this while, I'm also going to talk about guidance and best practices around the new sequencer. Uh, when the work started with the new sequencer, uh, these were the four key areas where the product team decided to focus their attention on. Uh, I have them up there because I want to show you that a lot of feedback that we gave back to the product group, uh, how did it actually find its way into the main product? So I'm going to try and structure my session in the same way. Uh, we're going to start uh, our discussion today with diagnostic. Uh, and that's basically a way to show you how uh, the new sequencer has a lot more information in terms of diagnostics, uh, presents you with a lot more information uh, about things that could potentially make an AppV package fail during a runtime. Uh, so we preemptively look for those problems and guide you how to get around them. Uh, I have a good demo to demonstrate that. Uh, we're going to then talk about ease of use, uh, and we're going to show you how we've incorporated some new workflows in the sequencer to especially help people who are new to sequencing get it right the first time. So that's the idea. Uh, I will have a demo on that as well. Uh, I'm also going to use uh, that platform to show you how we can uh, do one of those advanced features of AppV sequencing, which is dynamic suite composition. So that should be very interesting. Uh, and then going forward, we'll talk about predictability. Um, and I'm going to introduce one of my favorite features of the new AppV sequencer, and that's package accelerators. I'll do a demo on that. And then finally, we'll talk about automation and how we've added support for some new scenarios uh, in the sequencer in form of project templates, expanding the command line interface, those kind of things. I won't have a demo for that, but it should give you a fair bit of idea about what those new features are. Sounds interesting? All right, so I know some of us here are probably new to AppV, so I just want to quickly take two slides and explain what really AppV is. 
Uh, app fee is basically a way to take an application, virtualize it uh, in a way that you abstract it from the operating system, and be, make that application available to the end users as a network available service. So if you want to look at AppFi, there are two big benefits you get from them. One is that your applications are isolated. That means they run in their own silo, uh, which means that they don't make any changes to the operating system where the applications are running. They don't make changes to the registry. Uh, when you decide to remove that application, there is no trace left behind on the operating system. Um, and also, it includes the feature to support uh, compatibility problems with other application. So if you have two applications that are known to have application compatibility between them, uh, conflicts between them, uh, the AppV way of running those two applications can prevent that application conflict. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit of AppV is that you make that application available to the end users as a software as a service concept. So you can think of those applications which are published to the end user. They don't get just pushed down uh, when the user decides to use an application. That application starts streaming from a central location to the end user's machine. Uh, it downloads the code necessary to launch that application for the first time, which is roughly about 20 to 40% of the main code. Um, and then the end user starts using the application. And when he starts using the application behind the scenes, the remaining bits are streamed down and that application becomes totally available out of its own client machine. Right? So that's, that's the second big advantage. Now, there is a management option uh, built into the product in form of an AppV management server. But besides a management server, if you already use any kind of an enterprise software distribution method, uh, SCCM for that matter, you can easy, easily leverage um, that solution to push out AppV packages to the client machine. Right? Now, we acquired the product uh, AppV, which is the reincarnation of an older product called SoftGrid, from a company called Softricity back in 2007. And over the years, you can see that we've kind of had an update of this AppV product pretty much with every release of MDOP since. Uh, MDOP, or Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack, is the shipping vehicle for AppV for our customers. So it kind of has a, a history of com coming up with continuous improvements. And that's basically the idea behind this slide. So to kickstart a discussion today uh, on the new sequencer, we are now going to look at uh, sequencer diagnostics. My goal you is during this session is to show you or introduce to you the new features of the sequencer and also show you how does the new diagnostic information that we've incorporated uh, helps you preemptively look at information which could potentially make your prob uh, application fail at the runtime. So that's the idea. Now, one of the most common questions uh, that I get whenever we talk to audience who are new to AppV or people who, when I'm uh, introducing the concept of sequencing, is what applications are good candidates for virtualization? The answer to that question is that almost all applications are good candidates for virtualization. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say every application out there can be virtualized. That's not the case. Uh, the truth of the matter is that while some applications can be taken up and sequenced in a very straightforward manner, there are some applications which need some extra work and tricks to get them to work correctly. So what are these kind of applications that need uh, more help? So I'm going to talk about each one of those three applications. The first category of application is applications that interface with the system. So you can have applications that have system drivers in them or device drivers in them. AppV on its own does not support sequencing or deploying dri device drivers to the client machines. But if you were to take that driver package out of the main and deploy it natively on a client machine, you can very easily virtualize the actual package and deploy it to the client machine. If you use products like SCCM or any kind of enterprise software distribution method, it's quite easy to deploy or tie those two deployments together where you deploy a driver first and then deploy the virtualized application. And if you do that, there's a good chance your application will run successfully on a client machine as well. The second category of applications that uh, have a bit of trouble in sequencing are applications that use non-virtualized extensibility points. And what that really means is that some applications add 
extra shell extensions to your operating system. So think of shell extensions as uh, an application that would add a different kind of context menu to a document on your desktop. So if you can think of a, a folder when you install WinZip, you right click on that and you see options for uh, compressing or adding it to a new zip file. So those are shell extensions. Uh, we don't have a support for virtualizing shell extensions in sequencing. The second kind of applications that uh, are also troublesome are applications that use uh, non-supported uh, extensibility points. And what that really means is if you have two applications that talk to each other in an in a, in a extensibility point, which AppV does not have explicit support for, uh, when you run these two applications independently on a client machine, there's a good chance they will not be able to look at each other. Now, we have a way around that, uh, and the way around that is to use something called as dynamic suite composition, um, and that basically allows you to merge the virtual environment of two separate applications at the runtime on the client machine. I will have a demo on this, so I'm not going to go into a lot more details on this right now, uh, but these, this is a very, very easy way to get around. The third category of applications uh, which have a bit of trouble are applications that have embedded state or dependencies. And what that really means is that you have some applications which store uh, different paths to different file names in a proprietary format. For example, let's say a binary form um, as part of that application installed. Now, we can't just, as part of sequencing, just go inside that application, look at that path, and modify it. The guidance there is that if you follow the sequencing best practices, uh, which basically tells you to keep the sequencer machine as identical as possible to the actual client machine where this application will be deployed, there's a good chance that application will still run successfully. Now, if you follow those best practices, uh, there's not really much to worry about. Now, with that introduction, uh, let's jump to the first demo. Uh, the goal for this demo is two things. First, I want to show you uh, what are the new features of the new sequencer, and also show you how does the new diagnostic information um, help you get your job done uh, more reliably, tell you about the problems that might make a, a package uh, not run successfully when you deploy it to a client machine. So let me jump over to the demo machine. All right. So what I'm going to do now is sequence a small package, uh, and the package in this case is Netmon. Uh, it's not really important what Netmon does. Uh, there is a good reason I've selected that package because it kind of shows you a state of an application which adds um, uh, drivers to the system. And I want to show you how the new sequencer can actually help you get around those and give you guidance on what can be done uh, to preemptively look at that problem and make a remediation around it, right? So let's start the new sequencer. This is the new landing page for the AppV sequencer. So let me take a minute and explain, uh, show you some of the new features here. Uh, first up, you see that on the first page itself, you get two options to select two different types of sequencing processes. Uh, you can start with either creating a new virtual package, which is the first option, or you can start with taking an existing package, which is already sequenced, and making some modifications or adding some bits to it. So there are two options. On the right side, you can see there are links to three uh, sections. The first one is app virtualization library on the TechNet. The second one is a sequencing superflow. Uh, for those of you who are new to superflow, they are like flowcharts that help you take an application, uh, follow a good process to bring out a virtualized package at the end. So it's like a, a sequencing flowchart. The third link is to AppV white papers uh, TechNet website. And the good thing there is that almost any, uh, not almost, every white paper regarding AppV which is released is all consolidated into that single site. So it's always one place for you to go and check if there's a new white paper around AppV released, which is pretty good. Uh, at the bottom here, we have links to some community content. Uh, so there is a link to a forum, a sequence recipe forum, uh, there is package accelerator, virtualization blog, uh, interesting stuff. The other interesting thing uh, before we start sequencing is that uh, I'm sure all of you would have seen, earlier our guidance around AppV sequencer was to use two separate disk partitions. So you would have one partition which will have your operating system and there would be other partition uh, which would have a queue drive or the sequencing drive. 
Now with this new sequencer, you actually do get an option that you, when you install the sequencer, that it will mount a virtual drive letter, the sequencer itself, what you would do in a, in a client piece. So on this particular client machine, if I was to open, you would see there is only a single disk listed here, right? At the same time, if I looked at my computer, you would see there is a Q drive. So in a sense, it's a virtual drive letter, which you would typically see on a client machine. We've taken that support onto the, the sequencer itself, so that's something new. It has changed the, the sequencing best practice guides which asks you to have two separate partitions. Now, it's still a good idea to have two separate partitions simply because you can, because sequencing is a very disk intensive and IO intensive task. Uh, if you have two separate partitions, you're always gonna get that benefit. But if you have a sequencer which runs out of a really fast disk, like let's say like an SSD, uh, you can leverage that SSD not just for running the OS, but also for doing other things. So that's a good thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first option which says create a new virtual package. And this is a new sequencing wizard that comes up. We did a whole bunch of usability testing in terms of seeing what are the common mistakes uh, people make when they sequence a package for the first time. And we kind of tried to incorporate those best practices into the sequencer itself. And that workflow that you see on the left side uh, kind of reflects the changes that have been done. So the first up, uh, I'm gonna select the option for saying I'm gonna create a new package, which is the default option. There is an option of selecting a package accelerator. I'm gonna talk about it in my third demo, so I'm gonna wait on that. Uh, go ahead and click on next. Sorry. Now this is something new uh, where we actually give you a report on what we think um, is the configuration of your sequencing workstation and what problems that we see, uh, what things that we see are running on the system which could potentially make your package uh, not work at the end. Now, traditionally, our best practice used to be that while you're doing sequencing and when you're monitoring a package while it's being uh, virtualized, you're not asked to make any other change to the operating system. Any change you do to the operating system while monitoring is being done, whether it's related to or not related to the actual package, it will become part of the package, right? So things like Windows Defender could be uh, causing a bunch of uh, file deadlocks which could make your packaging process fail. Uh, things like Windows Search or Windows Update could be downloading and updating system at the same time while you're monitoring. Uh, things like SCCM client would also be doing that. So we look at your system and we figure out what are potential problems that we see uh, with this machine configuration. So the first option here tells me that my Windows Defender is running and it gives you a warning. It also tells you a resolution of what you can do to actually get around that uh, warning. So here it tells me to stop the Windows Defender. The second warning here talks about Windows Search and it tells you that it can interfere with the creation of the package. Um, so it's again asking me to go to Windows Services and actually stop these two services. So let me go ahead and actually do that. So I'm gonna stop Windows Defender. And then I'm going to go to Windows Services, Windows Search, stop this out. The good thing here is, let me actually leave that MMC open to show you something interesting. The good thing here is that once you've taken those actions to fix those services, if you come back and hit refresh here, it will actually update the information here and tell you if there is anything else that needs to be worked upon. So in this case, because I have the services management console open, it gives me a warning that you have other applications running. Again, gives me a resolution that asking me to close out all those applications. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually close this out, come back, hit refresh, and you can see that those warnings are no longer there, right? So I've taken my preemptive steps on what could potentially cause that problem uh, and taken it out of the way. I go ahead and click on next and I get uh, three options of what I want to do now. First option tells me whether I want to sequence a standard application, which is the option that I'm going to select now. Uh, there is also an option here for selecting or sequencing a new plugin or an add-on for an existing package. The third option is to sequence a middleware. And if you see on the left side right here, as I toggle between these options, 
the workflow options on the left side actually change to reflect just that. So for people who are new to sequencing, it's always a very confusing concept of how do I sequence a plugin versus how do I sequence a middleware. We kind of understand that behavior and we kind of incorporate those changes into the sequencer itself. So the end user gets a more seamless experience. So in this case, I'm going to select standard application, go ahead and click on next. This is again a slightly different approach to sequencing than the last uh, version of the sequencing wizard. Earlier, once you go to this stage, you would get an option which says, I'm going to launch a virtual monitor, uh, virtual environment, I'm going to start monitoring, and only when I say begin installation, that's when you're supposed to launch the installation wizard for that application. That was a bit confusing because people would not wait for the virtual environment to be loaded in its entirety, and they would launch uh, the sequencer or launch the application installer before that really happens. Now we'll take over the control from here, so we ask you to point us to the installation bits, so I go ahead and click on Browse, go to my desktop, take it, click on Open, and I say Next. And what this is going to do is tell this sequencer that this is the application installer that I want to use. So when I say Next, it's going to ask me for a package name and then take over the control of first loading the virtual environment, starting its monitoring correctly, and then launching the installer itself. So we take over that control. Next up, I go ahead and click on Next, and it's asking me for a virtual package name. I'm going to give the name NetBond 3.4. And as you can see, it is automatically populating the package root at the bottom. Now, for those of you who are new to sequencing, this is an interesting thing, because earlier, we used to recommend you always have that 8.3 naming convention uh, for all the package roots. Um, and sometimes it became a difficult thing because you had lots of applications that sort of wanted to use the same package root directory. Now, in this case, that condition is no longer valid. Uh, we do not recommend that anymore. You, can, you are free to use any package root that you possibly want. So I'm going to use NetMon 3.4. Uh, if I wanted to change it for some reason, I could click on this Edit button and make some modification here. In this case, I'll leave this as default. Go ahead and click on Next. And at this point, the sequencer is taking over the control of actually launching the virtual environment uh, and starting the monitoring process. And as soon as it's ready, it will launch that MSI that was pointed to earlier. Now, as soon as that happens, you see this new toast pop up at the bottom, tells you that where exactly uh, you should be installing the application. So I'm going to say yes here. Click on next, accept, next, custom, browse. Right. So I get a balloon pop-up telling me the best practice of actually sequencing it to a directory that you've told earlier. I say next. It tells me that do I want a shortcut? Yes. Let's go ahead and let it run. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about this package, um, and I'm going to try and show you each one. Uh, first up, uh, this particular package actually installs a system driver. Uh, the second interesting thing is this package actually puts some data in a directory uh, in your My Documents folder, which is generally excluded um, in the sequencer, right? So let me go ahead and click Finish. There's a second part of this installation, so it automatically starts that. Let's just start this. All right. So as I was saying, uh, this package installs a driver onto your system and also adds a bunch of files to the, uh, the exclusion list of what sequencer is not supposed to capture. And whenever that happens, um, we get a final product that basically, when you run it on a client machine, would simply fail. And when it say fail, it would fail with errors like this. Fail to load a particular NPL script. Um, and then another error telling you that it cannot find that driver. So what I've done here is I've taken that packet, sequenced it the normal way. I've disregarded the warnings that I'm going to get in a couple of minutes, which is almost done. All right. So my package is done here. I select I'm finished installing. And it collects the system changes. Now. Whenever this happens, you have 
a bunch of applications that show up a bunch of warnings saying that this thing was not done or this driver file was excluded. Uh, if you don't pay heed to those warnings and actually run that application, those are the two errors that you would see. Now, what I'm going to try and show you is what really happens in the sequencer, which gives you a warning that these problems might happen on the actual package which gets deployed, right? So this is another uh, new change that has been done to the sequencer. So we now distinguish between when you are going to launch that application to configure it and finish the first time installation tasks. A lot of applications like Adobe, whenever you, uh, Adobe Reader, when you launch it for the first time, would pop open a EULA saying yes or no. The second time you launch, it's going to ask you for configuring the update settings. So we expect you to launch that application as many number of times as you need to get it to a static stable state. So this is a very clear distinction of what it's expecting you to do. Earlier, there was an explicit statement in the sequencing wizard which said launch that application. And what that stage really wanted to do was to sequence a package or get a package and optimize it for streaming purposes. So it was always a bit of confusion about when am I supposed to actually launch the application to configure it versus when am I supposed to launch that application to actually optimize it for streaming. So now we make that thing very, very clear. At this stage, I'm simply asking you to launch that application to configure it for the first use task. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click Next. Uh, it again collects the system changes and gives me these two warnings. Now let's look at the first warning here, which says issues that may affect full package functionality. And it tells me very clearly that there is a unsupported driver that was included as part of sequencing this package. And this driver will not be uh, available in the final package that's created. So very clearly it tells me that the new driver that is found is under your HK current local machine, uh, local machine, current control set services, NM3. If I open regedit, surely enough, you can see that there is a reg key for NM3. A lot of times you can look at the, the registry key here, look at how this driver was actually deployed. You can extract this driver out and actually deploy it separately or natively on a machine. So it very easily gives me that warning. The second warning here, it tells me that I have a bunch of files that I have not included that were part uh, monitored or found to be created during installation, and I have not included them because they are part of exclusion list. Now, every single package that you create will always have this particular warning, right? Because there are certain parts which we would avoid by default not to include in the final package. Now, in this case, you can see we are excluding data from the temp directory, which is expected, and we don't want to package that. But at the same time, if you go down, you're going to see that there are actually references to three, two folders and a file which were actually part of my documents folder, which was also ex excluded. Now, when we looked at the error message that that application had when you ran it on a client machine, it clearly said that the NPL file was not found, and it clearly gave us an indication that a particular driver was missing. Here in the sequencer diagnostics, you actually get information for both of those error message before you move forward. So if you did not take care of these things right now, that's exactly the two errors that you're going to get on the client machine. So it makes your sequencing process a lot more reliable and effective, and there's a very good chance when you sequence an application for the first time, look at these warnings, take the remediation action, there's a very good chance you're going to get a package that's going to be successful, reliable, and efficient on the first launch itself. Right? So I can come back and say stop now. It's going to go ahead and create the package and save the package to my desktop. I go ahead and click create. And uh, by the end of it, you're going to see the package that gets created here. These are the common manifest files. Now, one of the new things that you would notice in this directory is that we have something new called report.xml. Now, in earlier versions of the sequencer, there was no concept of report.xml. Uh, we have This is a new file that gets added as part of sequencing an application with the new sequencing wizard, uh, and it's going to be part of every single package. Now, let me pop open one and actually show you what it contains. If you look through this XML file, you will find that it has information about all the warnings that were 
advertised to me at the time when my prepare system configuration report was done. So the two warnings that I got about uh, Windows Search and Defender being on, if I simply click Next and did not stop those services, that information will get captured here. The other thing you would notice here that this XML file also has information about the files that were actually uh, excluded. So it tells you very clearly that these three files were excluded from the main package and it also gives you information about the actual driver which was excluded. The idea behind this report.xml is that when you actually take this package and give it to a team which actually deploys it in production, and when they run this application and find an error, they can go back and look at this report.xml and find out what were warnings or what uh, notifications were actually not catered for, which is potentially causing that application to fail. So those, that's, that makes this information very, very valuable. So even if you distribute this package to anyone else, they can look at the report.xml and actually take an understanding, get an understanding of what exactly went on. Any questions with this? Let me jump back to the presentation. So just to summarize what we saw in the demo, the sequencer detects and provides guidance on what could potentially go wrong with a given package at two instances. The first instance is when you see the prepare computer report. We capture or give you a warning about instances where we detect there is a pending reboot on the system. So if your OS has a patch installed and an application installed and it's asking you for a reboot and you haven't really done that reboot and you start your sequencing on top of that half installed state of OS, we give you a warning around that. Uh, if your VM is actually not reverted back, so if you've sequenced something and then you go on the same machine and you try to sequence another package, we detect that and we give you a warning around that. You have forgotten to uh, revert your virtual machine. Um, any services we saw, uh, that could potentially cause your package to fail. We detect and actually give you a warning on that. There are some services here like Windows Update that we intercept and stop while your sequencing process starts. But then there are some services like Windows Defender which are more in security space and we don't want to automatically stop them without asking you to do it. So those services, we give you a warning and ask you to stop it yourself. Uh, any application that could be running uh, which could potentially make your package fail, uh, we detect and give you a warning around that. So that's the first phase where we get those warnings. The second phase where we get those warnings is when we get the installation report at the end. And we saw in the example uh, of Netmon that we got information about any excluded files, which were the NPL files, any drivers, in this case that was a, a Netmon driver, uh, any complex uh, registrations that application has done. Uh, there, whenever you have a virtual application that uses COM plus and you have this virtual application running on a client machine, the COM plus objects that are registered and created are created in their own silo. They're not created in the global namespace. So we take care of that and we give you information about what those COM plus registrations are. We also look at any system differences. So let's say you have a package that you've initially created on a Win7 um, RTM build and then you take this package and you want to apply an update to it, but now you're using a sequencer which is Win7 SP1. So we detect the changes between the two operating systems and tell you and give you a warning around that, that these are the changes you may want to go back and use a differencing, different uh, sequencing machine. We also look at any side-by-side -side conflicts or any shell extensions that are included as part of the package and give you a, a heads up on those things as well. All these information, whether it's from computer report or installation report, find its way into the report.xml, and that's part of every single package, right? All right, so let's dive into our next pillar, which is about ease of use. And to demonstrate this feature, I'm gonna talk about two things. First part is about adding new workflows. We saw a glimpse of that when we started looking at this new sequencer in terms of how you would sequence a plugin versus a middleware. So I'm gonna try and show you what are the different workflows. I'm also gonna show you how you can create a package, let's say a plugin for Office, uh, and sequence it with a new sequencer, and then use a tool like Dynamic Suite Composition Tool to actually link those two packages together. The idea here is for people who are new to sequencing, uh, things like changing, in the, changing the workflow helps you get the right uh, options 
helps you select the right approach to get your package right the very first time, right? So because dynamic suite composition is a fairly advanced concept in terms of app fee, uh, think of that in, in a very simple way as you have two applications which are both packaged independently. If you take these two applications and run it on a client machine, they're gonna run in their own silos. They will have no visibility to each other's virtual environment. Now, if there is a, a concept that you have a main application, let's say you decide to sequence a plugin later, you would want the plugin to be able to see the virtual environment of the actual main package, and you would want to be able to see the virtual environment of the plugin from the primary packet. So you would want both those virtual environments to be merged with each other. Dynamic Suite Composition tool allows you to do just that. The tool is a way to link those two dependencies. Dynamic Suite Composition is a process which allows you to merge those processes together. There are certain scenarios where this could be very, very useful. If you have multiple uh, packages like plugins or middleware or shared components, you can easily use Dynamic Suite Composition to create an easy package. The other interesting aspect of uh, looking at scenarios where DSC is useful is when you have situation where you have small dependent applications. So just to kind of summarize that in a, in a slightly different manner, think of an environment where you have 10 applications, each requiring Java runtime, right? So in an earlier method, what you had to do was take all these 10 applications, and during sequencing, you'll have to install Java as part of installation. So what that would mean is that you have 10 copies of Java runtime included in each of those 10 packages. So that means your content share is gonna have 10 copies of that content. When these uh, 10 applications get streamed to a client machine, the client machine is going to get 10 copies of that Java runtime. So that's a problem in itself, right? You're, you're repeating the same work. The second big problem is that let's assume there is a new security update which is sort of mandatory for this Java runtime. And if you had to apply that update, you'll have to take all these 10 applications, take it to the sequencer machine, open them one by one, apply those updates, create new updated packages, and then go back and deploy them again. Well, in case of dynamic suite composition, what you could simply do is take all these 10 applications, point them to one copy of that Java runtime virtual package, have all 10 of them point to one package, deploy this one package independently on a client machine, and if there is ever an update, all you have to do is update that one package. All other 10 applications automatically start using the, the, the new Java runtime environment that you've packaged. So it's kind of interesting to see um, the two different methods in which dynamic suite composition works. In first example, I have two separate applications, two separate .NET applications, which need dynamic suite composition for uh, .NET framework. Now, so what we do is we link each of those primary apps uh, in their OSD files and point them to the uh, virtual package for .NET Framework. Now in this case, what really happens is when these applications are actually launched on a client machine at a runtime, we pull an individual copy of this runtime into the virtual environment of each of these two apps. Now it's interesting because the copy of .NET Framework that you see inside .NET App 1 is its own copy of .NET Framework, which basically means any changes that application does to that copy is isolated for that application itself. It will not go up and corrupt that .NET Framework package environment for .NET App 2 in this case. So it'll have independent silo for running both .NET Frameworks individually for both applications. So that's the first case. The second case is where you have an application like Excel, which has multiple plugins. Now in this case, because you have the primary package pointing to two dependent packages, you will see both those packages, the virtual environment for both those packages gets pulled inside the main primary app. And what that results is in a simple procedure where you have a virtual environment for all these three apps can actually look at each other and contribute. So that, those are the two scenarios. With that introduction, let me jump to my demo machine and show you how we can actually sequence a simple plugin for Office. Now what I'm gonna do is I have a virtualized co uh, copy of uh, Office 2007 that I've sequenced ahead of time. Office sequencing uh, takes roughly about an hour and I did not want to spend that time doing it here. So I already have a copy of virtual package. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take 
this package and actually sequence uh, a separate package for save as PDF and XPS plugin and then show you how we can actually link them together. What I'm also going to use uh, is a new feature of the app, the sequencer, uh, which basically allows me to save time while doing just this. Traditionally, if you were to do this on, a, on an old sequencer, what you had to do was sequence Office 2007, then take that package out of that sequencer, revert the changes, then start back that sequencing machine, install the Office 2007 locally again, which would probably take about 20, 25 minutes. Once that is done, you would then start the AppT sequencer and then plug in the sequence, right? I'll have a workflow in later on to show you exactly how that was done. Now in this case, we've added a new feature and that's called expand package to local system. And what this really does is that you simply point this sequencer to a already packaged application like Office in this case. And it's gonna take that package and actually inflate it on a system so you can start with sequencing your plugin without having to go through all that Office installation again. So you can create a plugin on exact copy of that virtual application that you intend to run it on in the end, right? So if I select this option, it simply asks me to select the package that I want to expand to the local system. I have that package on my desktop, so that's what exactly. This package of Office is about 1.7 gigabytes. So if I select this option and say open, it's gonna start expanding. Now in order to save time, I've done that job automatically uh, ahead of time. And on my Q drive, you can see I've already expanded that package to the local system, right? So I can now go ahead and click on this new virtual package. Again, I'm selecting create new virtual package. I can see there are two warnings again. I'm just gonna go to services. And stop these two services. Now this time, I'm simply going to use the option of sequencing a plugin. And as you can see, the workflow for following the steps to sequence a plugin is very different from the steps that we use to plug in a standard application. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this, click next, and it's gonna simply ask me for the installer for the plugin that I want to sequence at this step. So I click on browse, go to my desktop, select the save as PDF and XPS, click on open, and then click next. Now, the next step simply asks me what is the name of the primary package for which this plugin is going to be used for. So it's asking me for the executable of the primary app. Now, in earlier days, we had a lot of confusion about which application is going to be primary, which is going to be secondary, depending upon what scenario you're looking at. We kind of make that process a uh, quite easy to do now because now you know for a fact that any application which has the executable, that's the application that you're gonna launch and the DLL or any other plugin that you're sequencing is going to be called from within that executable, right? So in this case, it's simply asking me to select the locally installed primary parent program. So in this case, I simply go to my Q drive. Office 12. I select winword.exe, so it gets me there. It's asking me for the package name, so I do save as PDF. XPS, click on next. And at that point, the system takes over the control of the plugin installation on its own. It's gonna launch the installation wizard for the save as PDF and XPS plugin. Now, there is also an interesting concept to look here. Uh, another feature that we have added is that we get this toast pop-up telling us to install this package to a particular uh, folder on Q Drive. But this particular plugin, because it's so simple and straightforward, it doesn't really give you any option to configure the path where you can actually install this package to. So if that happens, it's absolutely okay. We take care of any change done across the system as part of an application install. So just because this application is in getting installed in program files directory does not mean it's not gonna work on the client machine.
Now there is a good practice to actually always try to install it on the, the designated drive. And the reason for doing that is that when you do it, um, we capture the exact path as part of the package. So when you run it on a client machine, you don't have to do any kind of redirection and you get the package that gets a little bit of performance uh, improvement. If you don't do it, you're gonna use some redirection on the client machine to get it to work and that can cause a bit, a very negligible performance hit. Right, so that's the best practice. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and simply click on next. It starts the installation and, and as you will see, there is no option here to select the installation path. So I'll let this continue. Just take a minute. That's it. So as soon as I'm done, I can select the option saying I'm finished installing. Click on next and it collects the system changes, gives me the installation report. As I said earlier, pretty much any package that you sequence will always have this information event. It's not really a warning like your driver, it's an information event. And in this case, you can see the files that are excluded are all part of the temp directory, which are not supposed to be part of the main package anyways. So there's not much I need to do here. I click on close, click on next. It says stop now or customize. If I select the option to customize it now, you can see that you will see some new options. So it tells you there is a application which is Word, which is going to be used to launch this plugin. Next step would be to run that package for the first time to calculate that FB1, FB2 calculation, feature block one and feature block two. So we take that process of launching an application for customization versus launching an application to optimize in two separate strategies. We don't kind of mix them together and confuse, excuse me, confuse the sequencer. So in this case, I don't care. If I click on next, I do get a pop-up saying, since you have not launched any application, the entire package will become part of FB1. So it's a warning for me to know, so I say yes. It then brings me to a page where I can select what are the target operating systems uh, I will be using uh, this plugin package for. Now, right now, I'm sequencing this on a Windows 732-bit. Let me show you what will happen if I select XP. The sequencing best practice always tells you to sequence a package on the earliest option of the operating system, which is going to be a target for this application. In this case, if I select XP, I should have idly sequenced this application on an XP machine. So we take that sequencing best practice and actually apply it to the sequencing wizard. So the end user does not have to go through that huge list of uh, sequencing white paper and best practices and follow them the sequencing wizard is going to navigate you through those best practices on its own. So you get an option here. I can always select allow this package to run on any operating system. I go ahead and click on next, say save package now, create and done. So what we've just seen is that we've taken a package which was already sequenced before, which was Office 2007. We've sequenced a new package which is save as PDF and XPS plugin but there's a bit of problem right now that we don't have these two packages linked together. So the way to get around that is very straightforward. You could simply open the OSD file for the primary app. So in this case, let's look at Word. And inside the virtual environment, you would add the section for the code base or href section for the plugin application and simply paste it in this section under the dependency stack. Now, if you are finger friendly like I am, I'm always going to end up making typo errors while doing that. And to get around that, there is another tool that's shipped as part of the resource kit for the app fee and that's called Dynamic Suite Composition Tool. I'm just gonna show you how to use that. Launch itself. All right. So this is a very straightforward tool. What it asks you to do is select the location where your virtual application packages are there. So in this case, the packages are on my desktop. So I say package root is my desktop, say done. It will parse through that path and list out any virtual packages that are available there. In your case, when you take it to a sequencing workstation, 
you can actually point it to the content share in your environment, uh, and it's going to list out all the primary applications that it sees there. So at this stage, there is no distinction between primary and secondary. It simply lists out all the application. Now from the right side here, you can select the actual primary package, which is Office 2007. So you select that option, and you select the plugin that you want to link or do DSC against, and click on Add, and you get it on the bottom. Now you do have an option of selecting this checkbox here, which simply tells you whether this plugin is a mandatory or an optional component. And what that really means is that if for some reason I cannot launch this plugin app, I'm not going to proceed and launch the, try to launch the primary app. Now save as PDF and XPS is just a plugin. If it doesn't work, it shouldn't really stop my Word application to launch, right? So in this case, I'm not going to select this option. I click on save, it will ask me that, are you sure you want to save these packages? Uh, updated OSD file, I say yes. It's a good thing because it simply takes all the OSD files inside that Office package. So in Office package, there are about 22 OSD files. It takes all those OSD files and applies these uh, DSC code base changes to each one of them. So if I go back and show you this package now, you will see for each OSD file here, we have a standard OSD file which has the updated content, but at the same time, we also have a backup of the original OSD file. So it takes a backup and then makes the modification, so it's good in doing that. If I was to open it now, you can see that we have a new tag called dependencies, which actually incorporates the changes for the PDF and XPS plugin, as you can see here, and makes that change without making any changes. Yep. Uh, sure. So you can actually select what you want, um, not from the Dynamic Suite Composition tool, but if you're using the regular OSD editor, you can make, that make those changes for yourself. Uh, in this Dynamic Suite Composition tool, we'll update every single OSD file. Uh, in its benefit, the fact that I've not connected it or not launched it as a mandatory would allow any OSD file which is in that package which may not be using it to still continue to launch even if your plugin doesn't launch itself. Does that make sense? All right. So I can always click on the restore button and it's going to flip back all the changes that I want to the defaults so your DSC would be undone as such and that brings us to the end of this demo. Let me flip back to my demo machine. Sure. So the DSC tool doesn't uh, understand the different versions of the changes that you've applied. It simply looks at the main package. But at the same time, if you look at a primary package which has already a dependency built in, so I'm just going to quickly show you this. In this case, I'm going to select, launch the tool fresh, select Office PDF and XPS, sorry. So. So I've already made the change from last time. If I open up this and select the primary package again, it will automatically show me the previous linkage that I've done here. So you can go through all those different, you can add more stuff to it without really reverting back the earlier change. You can keep on adding stuff to it. Does that answer your question? So restore in that situation would take you back to the previous version? Correct, not through multiple versions. Exactly. So we saw in the demo how the new sequencer helps you, go, guide you through the workflow for sequencing a plugin. Now, this is just a quick example of how that really happens. We take the package files for the primary application, uh, which is a result of sequencing the primary app. We revert the virtual machine. We take the same package to the sequencer machine. We expand it to the local system. We then start the sequencing for the plugin, and then we get the new package for the plugin application. And finally, we kind of link them together using DSC or editing the OSD files. Now, when you deal with a, a middleware application, let's say like a Java runtime, 
this process actually changes significantly. This workflow would update itself to reflect just doing that. So in this case, the step one and four actually gets reversed. So you then go ahead and start sequencing your middleware application first, right? So you get your middleware application, you get the package out, you revert the VM, you take the middleware application back to the sequencing workstation and expand it to the local system. The reason for doing that is the installation for an application that requires, let's say, a Java runtime is not going to start unless it finds Java already present on the system. In most cases, it's probably going to launch Java installation as part of its own installation, right? If it doesn't detect Java available. So in that case, you can very easily go back and expand it to the local system and then start sequencing the actual uh, secondary or application as such. So then you get the primary application again, and you kind of link them together, again, using the same method. So the workflow has to reflect itself whenever you select versus plugin uh, or a middleware. Uh, all right, so we're now talking about one of my favorite features of this new sequencer, and that's package accelerators. Now, package accelerators are a very interesting concept, so I'll take a minute and explain you what they really mean in simple terms, and then we'll do a demo to actually demonstrate how uh, they actually come into play. Now, before this feature was introduced, if you packaged an application that required a bunch of different things to configure during installation or during sequencing, and if you wanted to share that knowledge with someone else, the only way to do that was to write what we called as sequencing recipe, right? So you would write a document saying, click on this, take a screenshot, paste it in a document, and do that. Um, you would then depend on others to actually go through that sequencing recipe to get it right the first time. Now, the concept behind package accelerator is very, very simple. It basically means that I can create sort of a machine readable recipe that can provide it to a sequencing machine say, this is my machine-readable recipe for you. Here is the installation media for the package. Please go do your magic and give me a, a virtualized package at the end. So I don't want to do any monitoring. I don't want to do anything else. I simply want a final virtualized package. And I want to leverage the work that someone else might have done uh, to sequence that application correctly. Right? So at a very, very high level, this is how a package accelerator works. You first get the package accelerator, and I'll show you where you can get them. You've then follow the guidance that's included in that package accelerator to find out where you get the installation media, what version of that application uh, this package accelerator would work with, um, and how to get the installation bits. You then follow the guidance there, you convert it into a package, and then you optionally can configure the package if you wanted to, right? So that's the last part. So instead of talking more about it, I'm going to quickly show you a demo of how that really plays out. So let me start and switch to this machine. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a demo where I'm going to sequence Adobe Reader um, using a package accelerator and using the new sequencer. So first thing, where do I get these package accelerators from? So if you look at App Virtualization Tech Center, there is actually a link to the AppV package accelerator gallery, which is hosted on the TechNet. If you clicked on this link, this is the right. This is the gallery where you have all the AppV uh, package accelerators published. Now, right as of now, there are about 27 uh, accelerators out there. Five of them from Microsoft, about 22 of them from other uh, users. You can always create your own package accelerators and submit it, submit it to this gallery. Uh, there is guidance on how to create your own package accelerator uh, and the best practices on how you can write the documentation around your package accelerator. So all that guidance is available, but this is where you can get that package accelerator. You can see there is an accelerator from Microsoft for Office 2007, um, Office 2010, Adobe Reader, so on and so forth. So what I did was I downloaded one such accelerator, which was Adobe Reader, and as you can see, the format of that package accelerator is actually a .cap file. So that makes it very open, easy for you to open and actually look inside what exactly is contained. So if you see here, there is a bunch of data that you can find inside this uh, package accelerator. One of the ones which is most important here is a file called readme. Uh, let me just find it. 
readme file and this file tells you how you can take this package accelerator and actually create a virtual application out of it. So what I've done is I've extracted this file from here and I can show you what it's asking you to do is first download the actual installation media. So Adobe Reader is published uh, in a form of an exe installer. Uh, it's not a really an MSI installer, but our good friends in Adobe have actually given us an option of actually extracting that installation media from within that exe file. So it tells you very clearly what is the command you need to use to extract the installation media out of that executable file. So it's asking you to do that. So in this case, what I can do is I have a command to extract, which is pasted here. Just going to take that, run it in a command window. And as soon as you run this, it's going to extract the installation media to a particular folder, which is straightforward. Traditionally, if you launch Adobe Reader EXE installer, it's first going to extract this media and then going to run the installation for you. In this case, we don't want it to auto launch the installer. We simply want it to extract the installation media to a folder here. So we now have the actual MSI package for Adobe Reader available. So we take this. We start the sequencer. I'll close the notepad because I don't want to get that warning again. I'll close the wordpad. Now in this time, I'm going to select the option of creating a package using the package accelerator. So instead of doing it the traditional way, I want to make my work a lot more easier. The whole idea here is that we want to make sure your outcome of sequencing an application is very, very predictable. So if you know your package accelerator is from an authorized source, it's validated and tested, and you have an application, it doesn't matter what sequencer you take it to, you're going to get the correct information at the very end. So I'm selecting the option for using a package accelerator. I go ahead and select a package accelerator from here. So let's go to desktop, Adobe Reader. It gives me that same information about the package accelerator. The same readme file gets exposed here. I can export it out if I wanted to. I go ahead and click on next. And that's when it simply asks me what uh, is the path to the actual installation media. So I can click on browse here, point it to reader 94, which is where I've extracted the files. Click on next, gives me the name of the virtual application package, which is good. Click on next, any comments that I want to add, don't want to do anything right now. Go ahead and click on and say create. And pretty much everything from this point on is going to be done by the sequencer automatically, um, except configuring the application if you wanted to. In this case of Adobe Reader, I would want to configure this application a bunch of times so as to get a static state of the application. I want to get rid of the end user licensing agreement for the end user so I can get rid of that. I want to configure that it should not check for updates so I can do all that customizations. I'm sure. Um, it takes care of all of those and then get me a final package which I can get without really doing any installation of any sort. Right. So package creation is complete. You can see that this whole process really did not take much time. Even though this was a, a heavy package, I can configure this or skip this step, click on next, and all it does, it creates a virtual package for you. Let it complete. I quite honestly don't know, but uh, the fact that we now have package accelerators help you, which are published by Microsoft. So you can take your Office 2010 professional media, you can take that package accelerator and create that virtual package for yourself. So yes, it's not really a virtualized package that we are given, but at the same time, it's make, we make it very easy for you to take our installation media, take our package accelerator, combine the two and get a package a virtualized package reliably, which is known to work in a given environment. So that's the step that we are taking. Right, so I click on close. Let's get rid of this. And you can see that my final package is now up and running. 
I can again lo go look at the report.xml and it tells me that any missing application or anything that was missing or any updates that were missing installed on the system are all captured here. So that's that's a good thing, right? Yep, sure. Right. Sure. I'll come. I'll answer your question in just next slide. Is that okay? All right. Cool. So just to recap what we saw in the demo, we've now taken an AppV sequencer. We first taken an installation media, which was in form of an MSI, a cab, a zip, or simply a directory. We've applied. Uh, the package accelerator, which is sort of like a dehydrated version of that package. It does not include any information uh, from the vendor, so it does not have vendor's intellectual property contained within it. I'll elaborate on that point in just a little bit. Uh, it has all those OSD, SPRJ, manifest files. It also has information about what is the file system map, when you're going to create the virtual package, all that organization stuff, uh, all that security description details for that virtual package, all of that is in form of XML. You put them two together on a sequencing workstation, and out comes your actual virtual package. Right? Now, coming back to application files, specifying where would the sequencer would find um, the installation media. So the first way is what I've just shown you, is that you have an installation media, which could be in form of MSI, um, zip file, it could be in form of a, a local folder where you've extracted files like we did in case of Adobe Reader. Now, the good thing that happens in that case is that you don't need any kind of monitoring. You simply point it to a folder which has the installation media, and the sequencer takes over and creates the virtual package for you. Now, coming back to your question, what happens in case of an executable file? The thing in with executable file is that we, there is no real industry standard on how you're going to organize your installation media inside an executable file. You could be doing a self-extractor zip file. It could be any other form. So that's the reason there is no inbuilt support for us to handle an executable installation media, simply because we don't really know how contents are packaged together. Does that answer your question? So that's, that's the fact of matter. Now, besides these, there is also certain other kind of applications that have a slightly more uh, what you would call intellectual property attached to it as part of the first launch. Traditionally, you would have your applications which, when installed, would create all the vendor DLLs and stuff at the time of installation. When you launch that application for the first time, it's only going to create user-specific user configuration-specific files along with it. There are some files or there are some applications which actually go ahead and create those specific bits of uh, files which contain vendor-specific intellectual property in them when you launch it for the first time, right? So the installation media does not include all of that component. Now, since you cannot include those bits which are ven vendor's intellectual property, put them in your package accelerator and distribute them, there is a way you can get around that. In this case, we ask you to simply install that application on the sequencing workstation so you still don't do any kind of monitoring. When you start the sequencing wizard and you go through the guidance, instead of saying extract the Adobe Reader to a particular folder, you simply go ahead and install Adobe Reader on a given system. When you install it to a given system, it creates those DLL files or any kind of files which have vendor-specific information uh, and which are created only at the first launch. So you get that whole package on your sequencing machine you then point the sequencer to that file or folder where it's installed, and it will then create that package for you from there. So in this case, there is still no monitoring. Sequencer will locate files from the path where you have installed your application, and you will get your final package at the very end. The last part of my discussion today is about automation. Now, when we talk about automation, we kind of wanted to support some new scenarios. Um, with the new AppV sequencer. We wanted to take care of uh, situations where you would want to configure your own uh, environment when you start a sequencer. You configure your changes regarding exclusion files. Uh, you configure your changes about what path that you would want to include as part of sequencing. 
uh, any file and registry exclusion paths, uh, target platforms, any such thing. So earlier, you had to open up your sequencer, make these changes, and then when you revert your changes and you go back to that sequencer again, those changes would be lost. Now there is a simple way in which you can apply those best practices on the sequencer, export it out in form of a project template, and then distribute it to other packaging experts in your group and have them use those same best practices. So you can export the configuration, take it to another machine, and import it there. You can do that from a command line when you launch SFT sequencer, and there is, a, there is an example of how you can do that. The other new scenario that we support now is optimizing packages using the command line interface. Now, when we started looking at the new sequencer, we saw that a lot of our customers actually use command line sequencing as well. One of the biggest drawbacks that we saw was that when you do a command line sequencing, there was no way for you to configure that application for FB1 or FB2. So you could not optimize that package for streaming. Pretty much the whole package became part of FB1, so that means the whole package had to be downloaded on the client machine before you could launch it. Well, now you have options to actually launch um, some applications or all applications and when you do command line sequencing. You also have options to control the timeout or an uptime value, which basically means you're going to run that application for X number of seconds and then quit them automatically. So you can do all that optimization for sequencing as part of command line sequencing as well. But that pretty much brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, just to do a quick recap on things we spoke about. Uh, we started our discussion today with diagnostics. We looked at how the diagnostic reports uh, help us detect and avoid issues. We talked about ease of use in terms of the workflows that have been added to the new sequencer, uh, which help us make sure we get the package right the very first time. We looked at dynamic suite composition to see how it makes it easy for you to combine two virtual environments of separate packages together at the runtime. We talked about predictability in terms of uh, using package accelerators to create a reliable package uh, from an installation media. And we then talked about automation in terms of how the new support for scenarios which allow you to do uh, sequencer configuration and command line interface in, a, in an efficient manner. So the next question is, where can I get this new sequencer? You can get it from the Microsoft Download Center. You can get from Volume Licensing website, MSDN, and TechNet. It was released to general audience on uh, 11th of March this year, so it's been about a few months. Uh, you can also get the package accelerators online from two places the package accelerator website on the download center or from the TechNet gallery for package accelerators. All right, so I'm going to start open uh, for the next five minutes Q&A session. Uh, for those of you who are about to leave, I'm just going to ask you to please provide me feedback on the content, on the presentation. This is the first time I'm presenting at TechEd, so I'd love to get your feedback. And if you submit your feedback, you stand a chance to win one of these cool new mouses. Uh, there is also a TechQuest uh, tag which I'm sure you're already hopped onto, uh, and that's pretty much it. So let's start with the questions. I'll have the mic forwarded to you. Can you give him the mic? Well, I think he had a question. Sure. Sure. So if there is a, a specific config file that you wanted to add, during sequencing, you come to a page where it asks you for a virtual file system, and you can add a file there. The other way of doing it could be as part of editing the SFT. So you can open up an SFT package and add content there. Um, the best way, of course, would be to do it during the sequencing process itself. So that's the best way. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, no, no. Uh, there's a good reason for doing that. Uh, and the reason is you don't need to. A virtual package has full visibility for all the application installed natively on the box. So if I, had, if I have, let's say, a PDF and XPS plugin, and I launch the virtual environment, and then I launch Office, right? it can see that the Office is already pre-installed. So virtual applications have full visibility on the operating system. 
other applications on the operating system do not have visibility to virtual application unless you're specifically going to tell them about it. So yeah, that's a question. Any other questions? Yep. So you're looking at a tiered architecture. Yes. So one so main app calling a plugin, plugin calling another plugin, absolutely. So there's an example where you would have Office linked to Communicator, linked to Live Meeting, all these three linked together, and that would work. Yes, it's a supported scenario. Yep. Sure. So the thing is, uh, we do take care of your drive letter redirection, but there, as I said, there are certain applications that have those you know, proprietary configuration in proprietary format, uh, which could potentially make that application not work. The guidance around using the same drive letter is simply to increase your success rate. It's not a mandatory thing. Uh, the drive letter on the client machine should be similar to the sequencer's drive letter where you're sequencing it as a best practice. In case of PDF and XPS, the application actually got installed to C drive, and it would still continue to work. So it's a best practice intended to increase your success rate, not a mandatory requirement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of. Uh, guys, since we are at the end of our session, I'm going to go outside and let the next speaker come in and actually test it out. Uh, if you have a question, please find me outside. I'll be more than happy to take your questions there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.